Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about BMI, or the Body Mass Index. I'm going to say what that is and why it's important to calculate. We'll also be looking at something called the EAR, or the Estimated Average Requirement. We'll talk about that in terms of protein again, how you calculate it and why it's important to know. Now this picture is one that I start with my students in this lesson. So it says, there are now more overweight people in the world than undernourished people. The truth is, as a society, we are getting bigger. And statistically, the leading cause of death in the UK currently is heart disease. So you can see, knowing one's body mass index is really, really important. Let's think about what the body mass index actually is. It is a measurement. It's a, a number that tells you whether you are of normal weight, underweight, overweight or obese. And it uses measurements of your mass and height. Now, when working out the BMI, you often see tables like this. So... I'm just going to use myself as an example, and you can sort of see how this works. So my weight in kilograms at the top, I reckon I'm actually about 80. So I'm just going to go for, let's say, this one. This is probably the closest to me at the moment. So I'm about 80 kilograms. Height in centimetres, I think I'm about 180, which is about 1.8 metres. So I'm going to say it's down here. So if I draw a line across from the side and to the bottom, then I come out as a value of about 24, which according to this BMI table is healthy, which is great. But I have calculated BMI before using values when my weight had maybe slightly fluctuated and I veered between the healthy and somewhere in the overweight category. Now BMI isn't at all a great measurement to use because there are better ones, more realistic ones, um, ones that can account for random variations in mass relating to height. But let's talk through the formula, let's explain how this works. So, we'll just draw myself in here. So, I'm just going to use myself as an example. And what we're going to work out is the BMI, or what's known as the Body Mass Index. So, to work out the body mass index, you use this really simple formula. You take the mass, which is the amount of material that makes something up, so like one's mass, and the units for mass are kilograms. It's really important that you note the units, because sometimes you might have to convert from grams into kilograms, for example, or stones, or from ounces, so you mass should always be in kilograms. And you divide the mass by the height that someone is squared. And the height needs to be in metres. And again, you need to make sure that that is the correct unit. Now, I don't mean mass divided by height, the whole thing squared. It's mass divided by height squared so the height times the height as the bottom part of this equation so on the table what I was doing was using my figures which if we put in so my mass I said is about 80 kilograms I divide that by now my height if I put it into meters is about 1.8 so 1.8 squared 
on the bottom, that actually comes out to 3.24. So we can write is equal to 80 divided by 3.24, which gives me a grand total of 24.7. So that's what my BMI comes out as, 24 0.7. But we need to talk about what that actual number means. So, let's say what 24.7 means. In terms of BMI, a score less than 20 would mean that someone is underweight. A score sort of in the range between 20 and 24 would, on the BMI scale, be considered as a normal weight. A score of 25 to 29 would be considered overweight, so over one's ideal weight. And finally, that only leaves one more category. A score of 30 and beyond on this scale, so that's 30 plus, anything beyond 30, would be considered clinically obese. So you can see from these scores and what they indicate, that my BMI of 24.7 is actually a little bit above the normal range, so it's leaning into the overweight category, which is, in fairness, probably more accurate given the times I've done it. But like I said, BMI is not the best indicator. I'm going to just talk through some of the things that are a bit better than BMI to use when working out an ideal sort of weight and establishing whether someone is really healthy and fit because BMI alone isn't the best. So I'm just going to shrink this down a tiny little bit because often I'm just going to stem a few ideas, a few things that are a bit better in my opinion to use than the BMI. It's not the most descriptive thing. One thing that is significantly better than BMI to work out is the percentage body fat. Now, in exams you will be asked to calculate BMI, but you might also be asked to suggest a few things that are a better measurement to it. So that's what we're just going to do, put a few around the outside. Percentage body fat is far better. It tells you your fat level um, as a whole organism, essentially. And we know that an excess of this can massively increase the risk of heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, joint problems and other conditions. So the total percentage body fat is, is a bit more of a be more useful indicator. Something called the waist... The waist to hips ratio... Again, far better than BMI. With the waist to hips ratio, this gives a good indication of the distribution of body fat, especially around the abdomen, because, because greater deposits of fat around the abdominal area can indicate a greater risk of coronary heart disease and diabetes. So the waist to hips ratio is one thing that could prove more useful. Resting heart rate is, in my opinion, another good indicator of fitness over sort of the BMI. With resting heart rate, it's important because people who are fitter tend to have a lower value because the heart's bigger, it's more powerful, it's stronger. The heart is a muscle, so they've essentially worked it more and it can pump more blood around the body with every beat. So with the resting heart rate, we could work out one person's cardiovascular efficiency, 
which would really be a useful indicator of fitness. There are things like their flexibility. So measuring someone's flexibility, again, a useful indicator of fitness, could be used in conjunction with BMI. Being supple helps you avoid injury and makes you less likely to have aches and strains. But one I also want to just make a note of is lung function. Doing a lung function test where you work at the maximum rate of flow that you can achieve as a measure of lung power. Now we, st- we still today, we use BMI as a sort of benchmark, but it's just to be aware that there are better ways to measure and establish fitness. But if we're looking for a snapshot of whether someone is weight, of normal weight, overweight or underweight, the BMI, BMI can prove quite useful. Mass divided by height squared, mass in kilograms and the height in metres. So what I'd like to talk about now is something called the EAR, just explain the importance of that. Okay, so the EAR, just write that down, EAR is an estimated average requirement so we'll just put that down. It's our estimated average requirement. And we'll say what that is. So the EAR is really considered to be the, the average requirement of the, the amount of a food group that someone should be taking in a day, roughly, to, to be healthy. It's almost like they're the minimum requirement, if you like. Now, RDA, recommended daily allowance, is something slightly different. It's sort of a little bit more general. It's recommended daily allowance of all the food groups. Um, again, in order to some, sort of maintain an already good health. It can get a little bit confusing. EAR and RDA, for all intents and purposes, for, for what we look at in school, you can kind of take as leading to sort of the same end point. But EAR, if we wanted to work out our estimated average requirement of a food group, a sort of minimal requirement that we need for that day, you can use the following formula. So our EAR for, and the one we consider in school is protein, is dictated by this formula. So the EAR, and that value comes out in grams, which is really important to know. So the EAR of protein in grams is equal to 0.6 times our body mass. Now, body mass is given in kilograms. So it's important to know body mass in kilograms would give you an EAR in grams. So let's use the numbers that we've already talked about with the BMI. 0.6 times, and for me, if I take my body mass as 80 would actually give me an EAR of 48 grams. 48 grams. So that means in terms of protein, my estimated average requirement per day is at least 48 grams. And that's it, that's how you work at the AR. You do body mass in kilograms times 0.6. Now, Protein is an essential part of our diet. And we lower down the school when you're asked about food groups, you talk, you say for growth and repair, and that is completely true. It's the growth of our whole body, especially um, in for our muscles. Protein is essential. Our hormones, enzymes, um, structurally components of our cell membranes, many receptors are protein. So it's vital. At this point, I just want to finish by saying or explaining the importance of the EAR. Now, the EAR is an estimated daily amount. It's for an average person with a particular body mass. But there are examples of people that would need more protein. For example, a growing teenager would need far more in their diet than an adult with the same body mass. 
and pregnant women would also need more protein in their diet, as will new mothers who are breastfeeding their baby. Now, it's just important to note that body doesn't actually store proteins, but it can store the fat and carb that they get. Fats are stored around organs and under the skin as what's called adipose tissue, and carbohydrates actually get converted to fats or stored as what's called glycogen in the liver. Now, our proteins are made up of smaller units called amino acids, and we have what are called essential amino acids, ones that the body require but aren't able to produce naturally. So these have to come from diet. So to get my EAR of 48 grams in this instance, I will have to get certain proteins from the food I eat because my body won't make them. Proteins from plants are called second-class proteins and those from animals are first-class proteins and they would contain the essential amino acids that I need that my body naturally won't produce for me. Okay, hope all that helps.